Hello, in this lecture we're going to go in a lot more detail in the concepts of work hardening, dislocations and recovery. So we've already looked at the atomic view of plastic deformation. So just remembering there are two components when we apply the load. There's the elastic deformation which has occurred and that's because of the bonds being stretched. And we also have a plastic component. And what's happening here is that the elongation or the ductility of the metal is a result of these planes of atoms slipping past one another. So that when we release the load, we recover our elastic deformation. In other words, the bonds will snap back into place. But there is no reason for these slip planes to go back to their original position. So we get permanent deformation or plastic deformation. We see these slip steps occurring uh, right on the outer surface of the metal crystal. So just how do these planes of atoms slide past one another? Well what we do know is that the slip occurs preferentially along what we call close packed planes uh, in close packed directions. In other words the distance between the atoms along the plane is at a minimum. And so here are two examples of some slip planes. And so uh, here is a slip plane here where this atom uh, will be moving and goes over to an identical position as it's, uh, as it's sheared across along this plane. And here's another example of a slip plane where this atom uh, is moved over to an identical position. And this close pack arrangement occurs because it's requiring the lowest energy input. So we're not getting uh, atoms over here and uh, atoms over here uh, moving past one another. It has to occur uh, at a minimal distance to minimise that energy penalty. So we're moving planes of these metal atoms past one another. And I've identified one of these atoms with, with a star and we're applying this shear force across these planes and you can see that this atom will move over uh, or the whole plane of atoms will move over but you can see it quite clearly with the marked atom. So to do this we have to break the bonds in between the atoms and reform new ones. We find the stress required to do this can be calculated and it turns out that Roughly the Young's modulus, the value of the Young's modulus, divided by roughly 15. And this is a really high number. Having a look at different materials, the modulus of that materials, and let's have a look at the theoretical yield stress. So this has been derived by a calculation of, of breaking all those bonds and reforming them. And the actual yield stress of that material. So having a look at diamond, it's not a metal, but uh, it theoretically can undergo slip as well. It's got a modulus of a uh, 1000 gigapascal, so quite high. The theoretical yield stress is roughly 66,000 megapascal. And the actual yield stress is 50,000 megapascal, 50 gigapascal. So this comparison is not too bad. But let's go over to metals now. Let's have a look at aluminium. It's got a modulus of 72 gigapascal. The theoretical yield stress would be 4,800 megapascal. However, what we measure, if we put this specimen in a tensile test, we see that the actual yield stress of the, of the aluminium is only 40 megapascal. For steel, a steel alloy, mild steel, the modulus is 212 gigapascal. The theoretical yield stress would be roughly 14,000 megapascal, yet the actual measured yield stress is only 220 megapascal. So for metals, we see that there is quite a large difference between the actual yield stress and the theoretical yield stress. So something's amiss here. So we know that the atoms are sliding past one another on these close packed planes, but the numbers just aren't adding up. Well, fortunately for us, 
What we have within the metal are these extra half planes of atoms. I've said fortunately because if we had extremely high yield stresses of the material, surely we would have very strong materials, but we wouldn't be able to process them using standard techniques because plastic deformation is important during processing. It would be very difficult to do that. So crystals aren't perfect. They contain these defects. We see this extra half plane of atoms. And this defect, one of the most important ones, uh, is called what we call a line dislocation. So it's a, a disruption in the crystal lattice by this extra half plane of atoms. And we can show this in three dimensions. So uh, three dimensions, there is our, uh, a little symbol representing this half plane uh, uh, of atoms. Um, and that's now called our dislocation line. So a dislocation is a distortion in the crystal lattice along this line. Now if we apply shear force to this crystal, what we see is that dislocation will actually move. The dislocation is allowing that slip, the close pack arrangement of, this, of the atoms to move past one another at stresses much lower than the predicted yield stress. And we can see it in this video here, the dislocation moving when we're applying the shear force, the shear stress as shown here. And we can see that in this video here when we're applying the shear stress. So the disruption to the system caused by moving a dislocation is far less than that would be required to move the whole atom planes all at once. So here I've just got the dislocation moving in the opposite direction. So the dislocation that was originally within the crystal will now migrate all the way out to the edge or the surface of that crystal to form that step on the surface. So when the dislocation moves to the end of the crystal, it's leaving a permanent deformation or step right on the outer surface. So just to recap, the energy to move that dislocation is much less than moving the whole close pack arrangement of atom planes uh, across one another simultaneously. So what's happening is that that dislocation, you only have to break a bond, one bond at a time. Whereas if you try and break all the bonds along that close pack plane, then the energy penalty is too high. So an analogy to this, let's say we roll out a really long carpet. One way to move that carpet is to grab the ends and pull on it. But because the carpet is in contact with the surface or on the ground, then it is very hard to move that carpet. But if we, let's say, put a wrinkle within that carpet, then it's really easy to move that wrinkle all the way to the end of the carpet because we're just breaking say one bond at a time as we're moving that dislocation along and that's exactly what's happening in metals so it's the presence of dislocation which is allowing slip to occur at much lower stresses which is providing the ductility within the metal so we've already covered plastic deformation and we touched on the concept of work hardening whereby the metal as it's plastically deforming becomes stronger and stronger. Now work hardening is sometimes also known as strain hardening or cold working. Cold working because it's done at, at lower temperatures during the processing step. So let's have a look again at the nominal stress strain curve for a metal. As we go through, we can see the yield strength and then we can plastically deform as we go up into the plastic region like so. We go up to the ultimate tensile strength and upon here we get localized deformation or necking occurring within the sample and we see an apparent decrease in the nominal stress. So let's do an experiment now. So let's say we get our metal specimen, we uh, stress it, we take it above the yield strength of the material, up above it into the plastic region, and 
to a new point called A or sigma A. So we've stressed it up to a new point, we've plastically deformed it and we will now release the load and it will go back. We recover a little bit of the elastic component but it's essentially plastically deformed. So we take it down to a strain of B as shown here on this graph. Now if we apply the load again we go past the original yield strength of that material. We've made it stronger and we go up to a new point to where we left off before at sigma A. So now sigma A has become the new yield strength of the material and then it will plastically deform. So as we undergo work hardening the yield strength of that material will increase, the tensile strength of that material will increase, however it comes at the expense of the ductility. In other words, we lose the elongation or the percent cross-sectional area. So this is shown in this diagram of this metal specimen of the stress strain curve. Here is our original metal specimen, so it's got a low yield strength. And here we keep on work hardening the material. What we see is the yield strength will continuously increase. The ultimate tensile strength can also increase. However, it's at the expense of the ductility. So we're losing ductility like so. And this is an issue to consider because the reduction in ductility could be deleterious in that we get less warning of ultimate failure and fracture. Whereas a more ductile material, we get plenty of warning before it will break. So different types of materials work hard to different extents as shown here. So this is a plot of true stress and true strain. So we see that this material will work hard a lot more than this material shown here in blue. And we can describe these curves using this expression which describes the true stress to the true strain to the power n. And this n is a really important number. It's describing the slope in the plastic region. So we see here that some metals such as steel have a work ex hardening exponent of say 0.15, so that's for steels, whereas other metals such as copper alloys have a work hardening exponent say of 0.5. So the percent cold work can be found by taking the original cross-sectional area of the specimen subtract by the new cross-sectional area, so after deformation, divided by the original cross-sectional area, and to get a percentage, we just multiply by 100. So we can measure the amount of dislocations in a material by something called the dislocation density, as, and it's described as the total length of all the dislocation lines per unit volume or meter cubed. Now we could also measure it per a surface area or meter squared for instance, so we can go in there and count. But either way, it, it's a rather difficult job to actually count the number of dislocations. So the number of dislocations in a material is really large. So typically the density of these dislocations are in the order of about 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 14 meters per meter cubed. So if we were to take a metal specimen the size of a sugar cube, there would be roughly 100,000 kilometers of dislocation lines, which sounds like a really large number, um, and, and it certainly is, but it pales into comparison if we were to line up all the atoms in, in a single line within that same sugar cube, then we were, would be able to reach distances up to uh, from the Earth to the Sun and, and almost back. So it's actually a large number, but quite small in comparison to the total number of atoms within the material. So what we know is ductility within the metal is occurring because of slip, and slip can occur because of the presence of these dislocations. Now this seems to be quite contradictory because 
what will happen during work hardening, the number of dislocations will dramatically increase and therefore the distance between the dislocation will decrease. So the strain hardening phenomena can be explained on the basis of dislocation, dislocation, strain field interactions. So what we see here in this dislocation with this extra plane of atoms that is sort of forced into the crystal lattice like so, is that this region will be under a lot of compression, whereas down below this dislocation line, it's under tension. So as the dislocations move together, the strain interactions on average are repulsive and the dislocation movement is therefore restricted. Therefore, by restricting dislocation movement, we can increase the yield strength of the material, but we reduce the ductility of that material. So work hardening is one such method to strengthen a material. Now, just be aware that there are many other types of ways to strengthen the material. We can form alloys, so we can put other types of atoms into the metal, or we can put little precipitates within the crystal lattice as well, something called precipitation hardening. But all these mechanisms have the same effect. They're restricting dislocation movement. So what I've plotted up here is the yield strength versus density. So it's similar to that modulus versus density plot that I did previously. So some typical values, let's say for the metals and metal alloys, these will have elastic limits around the order of say 50 to 100 megapascal. And here uh, polymers have elastic limits well below that of 100 megapascal, much lower. And the foams natural materials again lower than the metals. So when we work hardened material, let's say we've processed it into the desired shape that we want, we have to be aware that we will lose the ductility of that material. So what we can do to recover that ductility, we've got it in the shape that we want, but we want to have a higher ductility, say, what we can do is a processing technique called annealing. And it's very simple. Really, all we do is we heat the material up below its melting point. And what we see here, as we heat it up, we can measure the tensile strength or the ductility with annealing temperature, as I've shown here. And what we see is that the tensile strength, as we are heating it up, we've got a process called recovery, uh, recrystallization and grain growth or crystal growth. And what we see is that we lose that tensile strength, but we regain our ductility and that can be quite important. So what we see in recovery at the lower types of temperatures is that that thermal energy can allow atoms to diffuse to these regions of high tension and repair or annihilate that dislocation that was present in there so that now we get a more perfect crystal. So we've annihilated that dislocation. So just remember when we work hard the material, the number of the dislocations will increase significantly. So at this lower temperature, this process is called recovery. So we regain some of this ductility. What we can do is go up to a higher temperature called recrystallization temperature. So we're below the melting point, but what we will do now is actually form new crystals. And these new crystals will engulf the work hardened crystals, which have all the dislocations within them. And these new crystals are more perfect. They're a bit smaller, but they have a lower dislocation density. And hence we can now regain some of the ductility within the metal specimen. So this concept of doing a tensile test and plastically deforming a metal and then recovering the ductility is going to be important for the practical that you'll be doing in this course, the tensile test prac. That concludes this lecture. Thanks for listening.